of access and quality. And this is the problem of education in the world, right? Pe poor people don't have access to school. Is that a problem in some parts of Ethiopia? Could actually take it up as a livelihood activity uh, and turn it into something for themselves. But within the school's context, they used to, uh, to bring in money to pay for the school. And so from there, we've uh, spent many years kind of plugging away. At it. it took five years for that school to get to the point where it could pay for itself. But before we even kind of got there, we, we started batting around ideas because Paraguay, I don't know how many of you here have been to Paraguay, but uh, well, actually, at least, at least one or two. But uh, you're, you're unusual, you know. You speak to anyone in the UK about Paraguay, and at best they know it's somewhere in South America, sort of, they assume it's somewhere between Peru and Uruguay, uh, and, which isn't entirely wrong. But, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, basically, no, nothing comes out of Paraguay is the kind of uh, the, the traditional view. So if we kind of just left this as one amazing school that just worked nicely as a, something in itself in Paraguay, the world would be sort of really losing out. So we had a, a little think about how, how to take it to a new level. We came up with this kind of idea where we have Martin's organization uh, in Paraguay, the Fundación Paraguaya, really pushing from the grassroots level, but to set up another organization based in the north, which we call Teach Him Out to Fish, uh, and have that kind of really pushing the model internationally. So now, after three years, we've got a, a network of members that extends to 105 countries, there's about 1,400 members in it. And these are organizations and individuals working in education who are interested in taking this model and, and applying it on, on, a, on a much wider scale. We're also supporting new projects ourselves uh, across Africa, uh, a couple in Latin America. We're just trying to get as many of these seeds planted as possible because just it, it takes a little seeding. What we're actually trying to do here is, is something kind of quite radical. It sort of it sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Martin sticks it up there, and we have school businesses, and we teach skills, and it pays for itself. But the reality is this is nothing like education that goes on in developing countries, or, or even in countries like the States. And uh, I've just come from a course in Santa Clara University for a couple of weeks. I'm just amazed how many people would be coming up to me after I explain this model and saying something like, you know, we need this in the States. We need a way keep young people engaged with education, because when it's all theoretical and it's about blackboards and exams, people turn off and a whole raft of people don't want to do that. But uh, at the same time, how, how do you make it kind of more, more relevant without, you know, <laughs> in a meaningful way? So this idea of actually taking real businesses, running them like businesses, and getting hands-on skills uh, delivered to the students alongside entrepreneurship really is transformative and I wouldn't be surprised if you know the school that Martin refers to in Philadelphia actually comes to pass. Um, so now we're kind of currently working with about seven schools internationally to replicate this model. Replication has its own challenges and uh, I'm sure if you ever have a chance to speak to Nabil he'll uh, tell you about uh, a project in Bolivia which is uh, trying to do it on a, on a wafer thin budget. But um, you know, not all of them are going to be successful, but uh, again, it, it takes an entrepreneur to kind of want to take up this approach, and, uh, and we're really looking for more of those social entrepreneurs out there, and, uh, and it also takes, uh, you know, an awful lot of intelligence and manpower and energy, and uh, to the extent that there are more people like Nabil out there who want to kind of be a part of, you know, playing a, playing a role in taking this movement forward with... Uh, I'd love to have you guys involved as volunteers or interns or whatever. So I'm kind of conscious that we've got limited time, so I'm happy, yeah, we'll have questions later, and uh, yeah, I'm going to be around a little bit. So thanks for listening, and I'll pass you back to Martin for part two of the Martin Bird story. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Nick. So I'm just going to show you how an idea, it didn't exist. It happened. Things, nice things happen. And this is, you have to be ready. You have to be ready for good things to happen to you because, you know, they're going to happen. And uh, when, when we started Teach a Man to Fish, we were actually at an English pub. How fun can that be? <laughs> you know, what are your plans, Nick? Glug, 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 glug. I don't want to go back to work in the banking sector. Glug, glug, glug. You know how they drink? Oh. So after
after we drank a few pints, yeah. <laughs> it's normal, yeah. <laughs> we came up with the idea, let's create an international organization. And we have an international organization. And, and we continued dreaming, and he came up with a plan, a business plan. Uh, he came up with a name, which was a, which he didn't invent it. Teach a man to fish is sort of like, we had problems with our feminist friends. He didn't like the name. And then one day, um, I received a call from the Clinton Global Initiative. <laughs> You know, have you heard of the Clinton Global Initiative? It's a... Yeah. <laughs> so, and they said, hi, we read about your, edu your educational program. Um, would you like to make a commitment to expand it internationally? Sure. How much money do you need? <laughs> Excuse me? How much money do you, would you, could you use if, if you... How much money do you want? Can I call you in a while? <laughs> so I called Nick. Nick, what are we going to do? He says, tranquilo, Martin, tranquilo. <laughs> says, um, we need, okay, why don't we go to 50 countries in the next 10 years, and we will need seed money, sort of $500,000 per school. Let's ask for $25 million. Okay. Hello? <laughs> Hi, the, the, the call was not good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, as of your question, we could use $25 million. No problem. No problem. What? <laughs> and so we have a program that is worth $25 million to go to 50 countries by the year 2017. Okay? And now, once we... Once we set it, it sort of like became material. And now it's written on a piece of paper, and there are people calling and says, hey, I would like to support a portion of that to go to South Africa. I would like to support a portion of that to go to India. And so we are now, there are 55 organizations in 27 countries that have manifested some interest. How fun can that be? And this brave soldier <laughs> was in Bolivia, in one of the, of the 55 pro, uh, uh, places this summer. So can you tell him he's, he was, he's part of this program? The Ambassador Corps. Ambassador Corps program. So Nabil, you went to Bolivia uh, with your bow and arrow. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us your experience. I, I mean, I, the school that Stand I up in the bed, so in your bed. Stand up? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, Go to the center of the room while you're at it. Why not? <laughs> I'll project from here. Okay. Uh, well, no, they can't. They can't see you. Uh, come here, come here. Yeah. This is leadership training. <laughs> um, well, the school I was at was three years old, and it was it was starting up. But I I feel that for me, and on a waiver thin budget, and for me during my time at the school, I was wondering, you know, the school wants to execute this, this, and this, and seeing the seedlings of that sprout. Uh, and then I was wondering, so what does the school aspire to? And then I had the opportunity to um, to visit uh, Martin in Paraguay, and then on the way back, uh, meet Nick. Uh, and, we, and that really honed it for me, seeing sort of from the visionary aspect and then a bit of the financial aspect, um, what where the school was going. And I mean, there is, it's really nice to see students buy into projects. And I felt that's what I definitely saw um, at the school in Paraguay and was beginning to see in, in Bolivia. That's all I have to want. <laughs> so are there any, why don't we uh, have questions and answers and, and, and sort of talk about what, what is, if we want to change the world, because this is not about this project, it's about you and you and you. Uh, some, some students want to change the world. They don't even know where to start. Some, some students want to change the world. They don't even know where to start. So they have antagonistic and hostile parents. Some people may not have hostile parents, but they say, how am I going to pay a mortgage? Yeah? 
How can I live a normal life and still have a social impact? On Thursday, you will see Victoria Hale, who is a great pharmaceutical doctor, who is making a living, but she's having a great social impact Should dealing with manufacturing uh, drugs that no pharmaceutical company want to do. So, why are you here in this meeting today? 